Good morning, everyone. 2023, this year, is the 25th year stolen from Julie Jensen. Birthdays and Christmases and new school years and graduations all taken from her. When a person dies, their family is devastated. Their friends mourn them and remember them. And after all this time, Ruth Vorwald, the first witness, cried thinking of Julie and remembering her death. After all this time, we heard from Angela Martinelli, Kim Noble, Carrie Ashley, Eric and Laura Shore, Therese DeFazio, David and Sharon Nairing. We saw the videos of Ted and Margaret Voigt, Marion Pacetti. Many, many good and wonderful people have died tragic deaths, but not many people, after all this time, would have so many friends and neighbors coming forward to tell you about them, to tell you what a kind, loving, devoted person they were, as Julie Jensen was. And it matters in this case because, yes, it is possible that even a mother with young children might end her own life, but that is not the evidence in this case. The evidence we have is that Julie told Ted Voigt, Margaret Voigt, Therese DeFazio, and the defendant's own sister, Laura Coster, about her fears that the defendant would kill her. Julie took pictures of things that troubled her in the defendant's day planner and gave them to the police. So the evidence here is not evil murder or tragic suicide. It's murder or it's suicide plus something else. Somebody committed a ghastly crime here. Either Julie Jensen plotted for weeks and weeks since at least mid-October 1998 to kill herself with a substance undetectable at autopsy, to plant evidence with her friends and the police and even in the computer that her husband was responsible, or Mark Jensen, who had tormented and punished and never forgiven his wife for years, found her replacement and then killed her. What a convenient suicide this was for Mark Jensen. Kelly Labonte wasn't just an affair. She was Julie's replacement. That happened, and it happened almost immediately, even without regard for appearances. The defendant didn't have to worry about losing custody of his kids or child support or alimony. How convenient. As an added bonus, he stood to gain $100,000 in the life insurance money, even if Julie's death was ruled a suicide. Julie's death was so convenient for the defendant that he couldn't even resist high-fiving his father after he got his house back from the police. He couldn't wait to throw away Julie's possessions to make room for Kelly. What excellent timing Julie's suicide was for the defendant. The timing was so good that she died before the kids got home on December 3rd, so the defendant didn't have to worry anymore about David's pleas for his mother. Now this is hard to fathom and it can be hard to wrap your head around the idea that a respectable member of society, a person with a great job, a nice house, two kids, a dog, a pool, an idyllic life, would poison his wife with ethylene glycol and then smother her to death. That's why Julie's affair and the years of harassment that followed matter because it shows how the defendant felt about his wife. He hated her. What the defendant did to kill his wife is almost past understanding, except he hated her. For nearly all people whose marriages are falling apart, the answer is divorce, not murder. But the defendant hated Julie, and we can prove it. 
There's the email to his girlfriend. See it on the screen there? You can see the text of the email. Hey, can't forget about you. Can't, don't want to. I miss you. Then you see the email you've seen repeatedly. This is the email to his wife with the pornographic images attached to it. That shows you what he felt about his wife and what he felt about his girlfriend. How he wanted his girlfriend, he had Julie's replacement. And for him, it didn't have to be a divorce because he hated his wife. And now I want to go to, I want to take a look at this harassment that we've shown you before. I just want to take a look at a few things. First of all, I want you to see the extent of it. There's just page after page after page in this exhibit that we showed you of the harassment. It just keeps going on and on and on of Julie tracking it. And remember, we showed you yesterday the page where she was told by the police, hey, you got to keep track of this. you got to help us. So if we take a look at this, we just see some examples of what's happening. This is the page we showed you where she was told by the police to keep track of things. And again, a few examples of the type of harassment that was happening. One of the things that Julie said is it always seemed like the person who was harassing them just was one step ahead. 12 95 photos left in truck at Ruther during David's Christmas program. That's quite a stalker there, finding the truck at Ruther during a Christmas program. That's amazing. That stalker is one step ahead. And then if we just go further, we heard in the testimony, too, the nature of this harassment. It wasn't just the hang-up phone calls. They would happen at home, but also, according to the defendant, they would happen at his work. The leaving of the pornographic images, they would happen around the home, but also, according to the defendant, they would be left at his work, mailed to him sometimes, but often left on his vehicle at work. These pornographic images, penises and photos of oral sex or what looked like uh, a woman in p position close to a penis, those harassing photos. And we see more examples of that. Several hang-up calls at Mark's office talking about David finding a tape. Found videotape in front of Brick Ledge of Garage. <clears throat> then hang-up calls asking how he liked the tape. Then various calls to Mark's office Soft, effeminate male voice referring to video. Photo left on Mark's truck at office. And again, we're not going to go through all of this. It just keeps going. And we showed you this page repeatedly, too, the new tactics, which le led to the notation of these harassing emails. And we recovered these emails. These were from the zip disk. They were found in the defendant's home, saved on what we would use nowadays would be a USB drive, a thumb drive or a flash drive. But back in the day, it was these zip disks. And what was found on the zip disk is the email that we showed you with the attachments. And because it's the actual email and not a screenshot, that's how we can see. It was from Mark Jensen to Mark Jensen, and he saved it, and he saved the images attached to it, and it was on those disks. I also showed you, too, that he saved some screenshots from a computer. And in the screenshots, I showed you in the background, you could see Trading Expert Pro was up in the background. So you know it's from him. So we heard, we heard about Julie's hobbies, gardening and crafts and book club. This is the defendant's hobby. This is his hobby. This is what he did for years and years and years until... Let's look when it stops. It trails off in June of 1998. 
and then ends entirely in August of 1998 when the defendant gets his girlfriend. Remember, Julie was alive for months afterwards, but there's no more notes in this harassment log because the defendant has a new hobby. <clears throat> the last thing I want to note about this, 61998 definitely found Mark's new office phone number, ranted, raved, and swore at the receptionist several hangups at the office after that. This was after Mark had moved to Stiefel Nicholas. We heard from this, the receptionist, Meredith Perez. She never got a call like this. Just more proof that this was fabrication. And think about the torment to Julie, because although Mark is reporting these things, who's at fault? It's her, because it's the man she had an affair with. And she has to tell the police about it. And when she tells the police about it, she has to repeat over and over and over again that she had an affair. <laughs> And she even asked for one police officer, please, Pleasant Prairie, just send me one police officer so I don't have to tell the story again. We even have the defendant making Julie think the pictures were her. And if you saw this email, you saw how he would do it. In this email, the harasser is pretending that he's taking a picture without her knowing it of a married girl that he's currently doing. Just the kind of trickery that was used with Julie. The man she had an affair with must have taken secret pictures of her. And now these are pictures of her that he's leaving around. This is gaslighting. And Julie's a smart person, but she's just constantly being lied to and deceived by her husband. And she's told by the police and the private investigator Hey, we think it's your husband, but she doesn't want to believe it. Now, remember the defendant's interview. We showed you several clips from that recorded interview. Not the greatest recording, 1998. But we showed you several clips from it, the defendant's own statements. And the defendant was confronted by Detective Ratzberg about this harassment. And what the defendant said well, he said he'd find them around the house, these pictures, because he did. He'd find them around the house, but it was a question of showing them to her. He said he did end up showing a majority of them to her. And then here's what he said. How many times do you have to see pictures like that and get reminded of it before you just, you kind of go, man, it's not worth it. It gets old and you put it away and I'd put them away and then something would happen and I'd get pissed off and I'd pull some out and I'd say I found these in the shed. Then the question was, when in fact you had them? And Mark says, I had them. I mean, you know, I mean they'd accumulate for weeks. <clears throat> How many times do you have to see pictures like that? Who has an interest in exactly those kind of pictures? That's why this evidence matters, because Mark's obsession with these types of pictures, with these penis photos categorized on his computer, with photos of oral sex, this obsession was his, and those are exactly the harassing pictures that would be left around. And yet he acts to the detective like, oh, how many times you got to see it? He wants to see it. That's what he wants to look at, so we know it's him because of that too. And it's another lie to the detective. Remember how much Mark Jensen struggled when asked about Kelly Labonte? He just wouldn't say, even at the present moment, that she was his girlfriend. He, of course, wasn't going to admit to the affair before. But even in the present, he couldn't say she was his girlfriend. She had moved to Wisconsin at that time. She'd moved for him, but he wouldn't say it. So I said from the outset, <clears throat> the defendant was under no obligation to forgive Julie. If he had filed for divorce after the affair, you know what, even if he did hate her forever after that, as long as he ended the relationship with divorce, then we wouldn't be here. 
but he never forgave her. That's what his friend from work, David Naring, said. That's what his friend noticed. Julie knew it too. It's one of the last things she said. She told Dr. Borman on December 1st about that affair and how she thought the defendant had never forgiven her. And that's not the only thing that Julie said on December 1st. Because even though her marriage was falling apart and she was miserable, when she was asked about depression and whether she would ever kill herself, she said never. She would never leave her boys. And how many witnesses did we hear from in this case? It was a lot of witnesses. Not a single witness, not a single one testified that Julie Jensen ever made suicidal statements, that she ever had suicidal ideation, that she ever made a suicide attempt, not a single one. Instead, what we can see in the evidence through the computer evidence is the timeline of the defendant's plot. That's why those emails with Kelly Labonte, the defendant and Julie's day planner, their respective interests matter because we can see the defendant's life reflected in those internet searches, that internet activity, and we simply do not see anything similar for Julie. Remember how dismissive Dr. Thomas was of Julie's lack of computer knowledge? You are to decide this case based on the evidence, not on cognitive bias, not on some make-believe story that's unsupported by the evidence. In contrast with the defendant, we have evidence that Julie Jensen was very unfamiliar with computers. That's the evidence. The very beginning of September 1998, that's when she has that conversation with Therese DeFazio. Therese specifically asked her about helping in the computer lab, and Julie said no. She was there to be helpful, but she just couldn't. She just didn't know about computers. And they joked about how slow she typed, 35 words a minute. Then we have Julie applying for the job at Bradford High School. Joe Mangi told you about that. Well, back in 1998, that job she was applying for, even for a high school, even an office in a high school, it wasn't a computer job. The secretaries at that time didn't even have computers. So Julie was very well qualified for that job. And when Julie had that conversation with Therese DeFazio about her being afraid, afraid the defendant was going to poison her, how she had seen the defendant on the computer, but he would turn it off or cover up the screen. Ms. DeFazio suggested, well, maybe she could look at the computer cache and maybe she could see what the defendant was up to. And Ms. DeFazio was familiar with a Macintosh, and so that's what she was suggesting. But Julie said she didn't know how to do that. She wouldn't know what to do. Ms. DeFazio even remembered David doing what kids do, right? They blurt something out about their mom. Oh, my mom doesn't know anything about computers, and it's funny, I'm teaching her. And it started a whole class discussion where all the other little kids joined in. And Ms. DeFazio explained, well, that was normal back then. Computers were just getting in the home in 1998. I am gonna emphasize once again, you are to decide this case based on the evidence, so I am gonna show you the evidence. And I'm gonna go through that with you because what I say or what they say, it doesn't matter if it's not supported by the evidence. So let's look at the timeline of the defendant's plan that we can see through the computer evidence. So we've seen this before, the dates and the times of this computer use. <clears throat> now the argument that you've heard from the defense is that, well, there's no computer use during normal work hours because Julie wouldn't have wanted to block the phone line. That argument is absurd and it's unsupported by the evidence because not only is the internet on this home computer not used during normal work hours when the defendant wasn't home, but it also wasn't used at all when the defendant was out of town. So let's look at September. September 2nd, 
you zoom in. September 2nd, no internet activity, the defendant's in St. Louis. How do we know that? We have his day planner. We also have those emails. Here's the email from Kelly, September 3rd. Thanks again for yesterday. They were together in St. Louis on the 2nd. There's no internet activity on the 2nd. Let's go to later in September. We have another trip to St. Louis. We have computer activity, internet activity, the early morning hours of the 11th, but then the defendant goes to St. Louis that day, 11th and 12th. And again, how do we know it? It's right here in his day planner, and it's in the emails. Let's look at what Kelly had to say about that time frame. Her email, September 9th. She says on the bottom, a massage tomorrow and you the next day. How perfect can one life be? Tomorrow the 10th, the defendant the next day the 11th. Let's go to October. The defendant and Kelly Labonte are in Appleton. No internet activity those days. This is the time period when the defendant and Kelly Labonte are going to Appleton. They're going to open up that office, the office where Ed Klug works. So this is where the defendant would have met Ed Klug in person and where the other people opening that office noticed there was something going on between the defendant and Kelly Labonte. So now, what about Sunday? October 11th. We do have internet activity in the afternoon on that day. It's afternoon internet activity. Maybe this is Julie. Patagonia. It's the Patagonia website that's being looked at. And then what do we have the next day? Email from Mark to Kelly. This is where he's trying to buy some things for his girlfriend, right? A treat, spoiling his girlfriend. Now imagine we didn't have these Patagonia emails to Kelly. How much do you want to bet Julie would have been blamed for these searches, these searches for women's clothing? How much you want to bet she would have been blamed for this computer evidence? But we know who was searching for Patagonia that day. Moving on in October, the trip to Chicago, the very suspicious trip to Chicago. Who needs to stay in a hotel in Chicago when you live in Pleasant Prairie? Well, that's what you do when you're planning a nice long getaway with your girlfriend. And we see it in the day planner, October 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. That's the trip to Chicago. And we see it in the emails. Chicago is the subject. Oak Brook will move on 1023 and open for business 1026. Where is Oak Brook in relation to the airport? Any ideas? So this email, right, this plan get together between the defendant and his girlfriend, that happens on October 12th. The early morning hours of October 13th, we have the defendant on the computer planning the Chicago trip. The O'Hare Marriott, Morton Steakhouse. Then on October 15th, I'm showing you this because it mirrors the defendant's life. On October 15th, we go from Bass Pro Shop to Big Cedar to Windstar Cruises, and we know these early morning searches are the defendant. He's the fisherman, so he's going to Bass Pro Shop. He talked to Kelly about Big Cedar, so he's going to this website. Then Windstar Cruises, early morning hours of October 15th. And what is the next email to Kelly Labonte? 
this string of emails from October 16th, 1998. Hey, wanna run off somewhere? I do love you. Kelly responds, what sparked this bold attempt at messing with me? Sounds wonderful, where should we go? The defendant says, really bold attempt? If it was really bold, you'd have tickets for the Windstar in your hand. Who was on the internet looking for Windstar? It's obvious, right? These emails are important on October 16th with Kelly Labonte because the defendant has decided he is planning his future with Kelly. He misses her, he wants her, he loves her. He's buying things for her and he wants to sweep her off her feet with this cruise. Here's what Kelly says. Considering you have a milestone birthday next year and we would both need some time to clean up our lives, so to speak, I was thinking what a lovely way to spend your birthday. You, me, sunsets, ocean, champagne, no outside issues. See, Kelly understands the practical implications of what the defendant is doing. You just don't go on an expensive, lengthy cruise with your lover on the side. That isn't realistic. So that transforms this conversation into what are you gonna do with your spouse? And so Kelly wants time to decide. She wants until the end of the year to decide either way what to do with her issue. The defendant says fair enough, no deadline on deciding, whatever time needs to be figured out, and then Kelly starts asking him, well, what are you gonna do? Do you have it all figured out? The defendant says, I'm thinking so, but then is mostly talking about her barring seeing a bunch of disgusting habits. Some details to be worked on, but then those are just details, not the big issue. But Kelly wants to know, she wants to know. It was the details I was wondering about, that's what she says. And the defendant just keeps on being vague. Murphy spins on details. Details are just noise in the bigger picture. Kelly, again, and you plan on dealing with the details how? One at a time. So at that point, that's when Kelly says evasive little shit. Kelly wants to know, what is he going to do? She's asked for the end of the year to deal with her issues, but he's not telling her what he's going to do with his. The defendant isn't telling her what he's going to do with his wife. Kelly calls him out for it. But what we know from the computer is the defendant is forming a plan. He's planning for a future with Kelly by searching for Windstar Cruises and he's planning for a future without his wife through the other searches on this computer. So it begins with this series of searches on October 16th, 1998, and it starts at 1.54 a.m. I'm not gonna show you all of these again, but these are the searches that go from underground to drugs to botulism and ending with poisoning. Then we move to the evening of October 16th, 11.57 p.m., and disturbing searches continue. First, we start with the pipe bomb article. This was the one about the man who was attempting to kill his estranged ex-wife with a pipe bomb. And this browsing session, this one, this one continues for over an hour until about 1 a.m., and I wanna show you the various websites that are accessed in this browsing session so you know who is on that computer and doing these searches? 